water. Chemical formula? Yeah, we all know H2O. Okay, and that means two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. That's right, okay. Two relatively common elements. They make a uh, substance that we like, water. Now let's see if we can draw the water molecule. What does it look like, the water molecule? Yes, good. I'm thinking of a cartoon character, however. Mickey Mouse, Mouse. yes, it looks like Mickey Mouse. Two little hydrogens, one big oxygen. And the angle here is something like 109 degrees. I don't know why, some quantum mechanical reason for that. The question I have, of course, is why these these atoms stick together. Now, if you uh, think about this, right, these are electron clouds here. And those electron clouds ought to be repelling each other. So why do the atoms stick together? And I know you are all taught in school, oh, it's a covalent bond, and, and that seems to answer the question. But maybe we can dig into it a little bit deeper. If you were an electron, and you saw little protons, where would you like to be? <laughs> now, you would like to be as close to those protons as possible, wouldn't you? And so you would tend to congregate in here. Now, of course, you're an electron, and electrons don't have really defined positions, so you'd probably be around here a little bit as well, but you'd really like to be in there. And since you're in there, you're attracting those protons, and the whole thing sits together in a nice low-energy state. The bond is, is there because of those nice charges. Of course, I'm defining this in classical terms, and CERN is the wrong place to be talking about classical terms, but all right. Now, if we, um, if we now take that model and we draw a line across here, you can see that there's a negative charge on one side and a positive charge on the other. The charges are not perfectly balanced. Those electrons tend to stay on one side of that line more than the other, which means that there's a negative charge over here and a positive charge over here, so the water molecule is a dipole. This is, of course, why water is wet. Water sticks to your hand because the little water molecules will rotate to, to meet the charges that are on the surface of your hand, and it'll stick to your hand, or it'll stick to any surface as long as that surface has some kind of charge dipole to it. Uh, oil doesn't have much of that, so water won't stick to oil. Teflon doesn't have much of that, so Te- water won't stick to Teflon, but at least it'll stick to your hand. This is also, of course, why water makes a good solvent, because it'll grab a hold of little bits of things and hold on to them with these small charges. Uh, there's a, a lovely experiment that I like to do, uh, where you get a thin stream of water for- falling down the faucet. Then you get a balloon and you rub it on your head and pick up a charge on the balloon. You bring the balloon close to the stream of water and the stream of water will bend because of the charges. And People like to say that that's because of the dipole moment of the water molecule, but in fact it's not. It's because there are ions in the water. But I don't tell my grandchildren that. I tell them it's because of the dipole because I want to appear smart. The other favorite thing I like to do with water, other than drink it and bathe in it and things like that, is I'll get uh, some batteries, some 9-volt batteries. And, you know, 9-volt batteries have this lovely uh, ability to have a, a, a male and a female end on, on the surface, so you can get five of them and plug them together, sort of like that. Of course, I'm not drawing this very well, but you get the idea. right? Get five of them. That gives you about 45 volts. Take that 45 volts, put it into a glass of water. I should turn that into blue so that it looks like water. Good. Take those two wires, stick them into water. Don't let them touch each other, of course. That would be a bad idea. Um, Put a little salt in the water, and you'll start seeing bubbles. 
Because 45 volts is plenty of voltage to tear the hydrogens off of the oxygens. And the bubbles will be hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other. I don't know which side is which. It doesn't matter. But the little bubbles will gather on the surface of the water. Of course, the hydrogen would like to go up into the atmosphere, but it'll be held for a little while down there. It doesn't move right away. So you can impress your children and your grandchildren by setting that up and then within 30 seconds walk up to it with a match and watch it go poof, which is cool. Now, if you keep doing, and by the way, the kids love that, do it again. <laughs> if you keep doing that, you'll notice that the water is getting hot because the amount of current is actually fairly high. It takes a, a large amount of power to rip the, uh, the water molecules apart. And so um, you'll drain those batteries pretty quickly. If you keep on supplying it with voltage, however, you will gradually lower the level of water in the glass. And you will find, if you're very careful, that the amount of uh, heavy water is increased because heavy water participates in this reaction at a lower rate than normal water does. So if you do this over and over and over again, and you'd have to do it many hundreds of times, you could get a fairly good concentration of heavy water, deuterized water, water with deuterium instead of hydrogen. I don't know what you'd do with it, but you could have it. Of course, this is not what we're supposed to be talking about. <laughs> Let's see, what are we supposed to be talking? Oh, yes, okay. I want to take you back in time to a simpler age when there were no computers in the world. This is hard to believe, isn't it? That there was a time when there were no computers in the world. And it wasn't that long ago. I'll take you back to 1936. That's when Alan Turing wrote this paper. And this paper is probably the, the landmark for the founding of our discipline. How many of you are programmers? See, that's almost all of you. What are the rest of you? <laughs> Managers in the room? <laughs> this paper is likely the, the landmark of the founding of our industry. There were other things that happened that kind of for sage our industry, we, we could talk about Babbage, we could talk about Ada, we could talk about a uh, few other things. But this is really the moment when someone wrote some actual code. Code that you and I would look at and think of as code. Now, of course, he wrote it on an imaginary machine, a machine that no one has ever built and no one ever will build. But the code he wrote in that paper is recognizable as code. And he had to invent things like macros and subroutines and loops and if statements. Of course, they weren't really if statements, but you, you kind of get the idea. If you were, who's read this paper? Now that's a deep shame, right? <laughs> read the paper. And I've got a good way for you to read this paper, by the way. Let me just make this note for you. All right? There is a book, and the book was written by a fellow whose name is Charles Petzold. Some of you will remember that name. Let's see if I can remember how to spell it. There we go, Charles Petzold. Uh, and the name of the book is The Annotated Turing. Now, if, if some of you may remember who Charles Petzold was or is. He's not dead. Uh, Charles Petzold was the guy who wrote all of the Microsoft books in the 80s and the early 90s on the, on the Microsoft Foundation class libraries and all of those interesting books that, that all the Microsoft programmers had to have in their bookshelf. Do we have any Microsoft programmers in the room? Yeah, minority here, huh? There's a couple of them back there. We all feel sorry for them. It's okay because they have to use Visual Studio. <laughs> Charles Petzold finally gave up on writing the Microsoft books, and he wrote this book. This is a fascinating book. In this book, he reproduces the entirety of Turing's paper, but he does so paragraph by paragraph and surrounds those paragraphs with all of the historical commentary and explanatory um, devices to show you what was going on and why he wrote what he wrote and the implications of what he wrote. I've, I've read this book uh, twice. It's a fascinating book. It, it reads very well. If you're interested in, in chasing down Turing, this is a really interesting way to get into that paper and understand how our industry began. Now, Turing, 
got involved in World War II, the code-breaking stuff, and he actually had to build... We, we, we should not call them computers because they weren't computers, but they were certainly automatic devices that did computer-like things. And they used devices that looked like this. Those are relays. Some of you probably know what a relay is. But you can look at the relay and kind of tell what it is. There's an electromagnet there. If you energize that electromagnet, it'll pull that piece of uh, metal, which I can show you here. I take that piece of metal, it'll pull it towards the other piece of metal, so there's a nice little attractor right there. Wham! That'll close. It'll put pressure on those contacts and change the contacts. So you can energize a relay and make it change the state of two conductors, switches. It's an electrically controlled switch. And with that, he was able to build, with a number of other components as well, rotary switches and so on, uh, he was able to build a search engine that could search through Enigma codes and try and find uh, the appropriate keys for the Enigma machine. Now, a relay will switch maybe 10 times a second. Effectively, a relay like this isn't going to go much faster than that. So you could think of that as a computer with a, a clock rate of 10 hertz. They wanted to use something faster, uh, vacuum tubes, but they couldn't really use vacuum tubes well because there was no mass production of them at that time. They were all very unreliable. They burned out a lot. Uh, if you tried to build a circuit with more than 10 or 15 tubes, it, it would have a, a almost no chance of lasting more than an hour or so. So they couldn't really use vacuum tubes early on. Later on, they could. Uh, but the, by then, the war was virtually over, and they never really got the Colossus thing to do much for them. But shortly after that, they did actually build a real computer. This is, this is a computer called the Automated Computing Engine that was built uh, in, I think it was Manchester. And it was actually partially designed by Alan Turing, and Alan Turing wrote the code, the first code that ran on this machine. Now, it was a 22-bit machine. Uh, it had an add instruction, but no subtract instruction because they didn't want to invest in the hardware. It had 1,024 words, so binary, 1,024 words, 22 bits wide. They wanted to store those words on mercury delay lines. That was the memory that they had planned for it. A mercury delay line is a big tube of mercury, and you put a speaker on one end and a microphone on the other, and you pump bits into the speaker, and the sound waves move through the mercury, and the microphone picks it up, and then you recycle it. So it's rotating memory. Uh, but they couldn't get that to work because every time a truck drove by, it would shake the mercury and mess up. So eventually they used CRT memory, cathode ray tube. Me Who's seen a cathode ray tube here? Look at that. Oh, some people have seen a cathode ray tube. That's, this is not a cathode ray tube. This is LEDs. Right? A cathode ray tube has an electron beam, and it sweeps across the surface. And one of the things about that beam is that it will deplete the charge wherever it touches, and you can sense that depletion of charge the next time you sweep the beam over that part of the screen. So there's a little bit of memory in it. And that's what they eventually used for the automated computing engine. It also turned out to be the I.O. device, or one of the I.O. devices, because you could actually see the bits in memory. Alan Turing would write algorithms, and those algorithms would calculate values, and then he would read out the values on the memory of the system. We don't do that nowadays, but that was interesting. Turing wrote code in binary, base 32, really. He didn't use hexadecimal, he didn't use octal, he invented base 32. I don't even know what to call that. But he had all of his own symbols for it. And he, uh, he would program the machine in base 32, in, in binary. And what did, what did he write? Well, he wrote, um, he invented the concept of a stack. Nobody had even thought of a stack before, at least in a computer. He invented the concept of the stack because when they built the machine, they didn't even think about subroutines. They didn't think about, oh, you might want to save the return address of a function. So he had to invent that entire concept in software. He wrote things like um, floating point packages. Who's written a floating point package here? Who's done that? Anybody? Oh, you have. You've written a floating point package. If you have never written a floating point package, go home. <laughs> It'll take a weekend, more than a weekend, really. But, you know, if you have family, tell them to go away. 
It will take you a good solid 48 hours of a weekend, you know, where you do the real geeky dive kind of thing. <laughs> Write yourself a floating point package that does multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction using integers to simulate, you know, numbers with exponents and so on. It's, it's quite an interesting challenge. Uh, and you could do it in Java and find it a very significant challenge. He was doing it in base 32. He was doing it in binary. He was doing some really interesting stuff. And then, he wrote a paper about a year later. And these words come out of the paper, and they're fascinating words. We shall need a great number of mathematicians of ability because there will probably be a good deal of this kind of work to be done. How did he know? Or did he know? Would he be surprised to find out just how much of that kind of work there was to be done? And do you consider yourself to be a mathematician of ability? Turing thought that programmers were going to have to be mathematicians, but not just mathematicians, mathematicians of ability. Because, he went on, our difficulties will be the maintenance of appropriate discipline so that we do not lose track of what we're doing. <laughs> How did he know? Maintenance of appropriate discipline. You and I live in a very interesting time. This was 1945. That was not that long ago. That was, what, 70, how many years? 74 years ago? That's a man's lifetime. I was born in 1952. So those words appeared seven years before I was born, if I did that math correctly. And now, how many programmers are there in the world? A few, a few he says. <laughs> Give him a prize. <laughs> how many programmers are there in the world? Now, I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, there have been some results that say it's on the order of 28 to 30 million. Others say that, it, no, it's closer to 100 million. I think it depends on whether you count the VBA programmers. <laughs> but let's use the number of 100 million because it's a nice round number and it's probably within an order of magnitude. Now, in 1945, there was one programmer in the world. Alan Turing. He's the first person to write code on an electronic computer. Now, 75 years later, ish, 74, 75 years later, there are 100 million. How do you get from 1 to 100 million in 75 years? What kind of growth curve is that? Is that a linear growth curve? No, no. Must be an exponential growth curve. That would be the best guess, probably. And if it's an exponential growth curve, well, there must be a base to the exponent. Let's choose two, because we're programmers. How many powers of two, how many doublings does it take to get from one to 100 million? Well, that's an, it's an easy calculation. A million is two to the 20th. A hundred is about two to the seventh. So 27 doublings. 27 doublings to get from one, Alan Turing, two, now 100 million in 75 years. Okay, 75 divided by 27 is two something, two point something. Has the, has the population of programmers doubled every two point something years? Is that the kind of curve we are on? Probably not, because in the early days, it doubled much quicker than that. The first programmer was Alan Turing, but the next day there were 10. A month later, there were 20. 
So the doubling rate was probably much faster than that during the first 10 years, and then it slowed down. There is ample evidence now to suggest that the doubling rate is on the order of five years. Now think about that. Does that match your experience? Is the number of programmers in the world doubling every five years? If that's true, and I have reason to believe it is, then half the programmers in the world have less than five years' experience. And this will always be true, as long as we are doubling at that crazy rate. This leaves our industry in a state of perpetual inexperience. A lot of people wander around and they look at, they look at the programmers and say, oh, these programmers, they're all young. What happened to all the old people? This must be a young person's game. All the old people leave it. No, we never left. We're all still here. <laughs> there just weren't that many of us. There's a lot more of the young ones coming in here all the time and they don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. Get off my grass. Well, that's really what this talk is about. It's about getting off my grass. Or rather, it is about professionalism. Because we, as an industry, find ourselves in a very interesting time. Now, you look around this facility. This you know, the biggest particle accelerator in the world. Massive discoveries have happened here. How important is software to this facility? Could this facility exist without software? And the answer to that is no. There's no way you could do what is done here without software. So you could look at software that way and think it is the, it is the substance of our dreams and aspirations. Software is going to discover the secrets of the universe. Software is going to get us off this planet. Software will take us to Mars and to Jupiter and to Saturn. Software will allow us to explore the solar system. All of those things are wonderful things. But, Look around this room. How much software is running in this room at the moment? And never mind all the laptops and all the smartphones. Forget that. Look in the walls. How much software is running in the walls, hidden inside those walls or sitting on those walls? There's this thing up there. I don't know what it is. That thing. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's got a green light on it. Therefore, it must have software running in it. <laughs> that clock has that clock got software in it oh yes it does of course it does I mean, it, even if it's not connected to the network which it probably is it's got a crystal inside of it because nowadays you wouldn't use a pendulum for god's sake and so you'd have a crystal in there and that little crystal is oscillating at 32,768 cycles per second and there's a little computer in there that counts the cycles and then does the whole math to do, to deal with seconds and minutes and it turns the little gears appropriately. How about this, um, sign here? It says on air. That's not the sign I'm interested in. It's the one below it. The exit sign. See those exit signs? Is there software running in those signs? Well, they got batteries in them. You'd want to make, ba sure they've got batteries in them, wouldn't you? And they're probably lithium ion batteries nowadays. And we charge lithium ion batteries with a little trickle charge that's moderated by a little digital signal processor that makes sure that they don't overload. So there's probably some C code written in there by a 22 year old at three in the morning. <laughs> the speaker, these speakers, there's speakers all over here. Software running in those speakers. Think about your home. Where's the software running in your home? Who's got, uh, who's got Nest thermostats? Anyway, oh yeah, Nest thermostats. Okay, so a few of you have Nest thermostats. How many of you have computer-controlled thermostats that have been taken over by hackers and used in denial of service attacks? <laughs> right? Because they sit on the network, right? And nobody thinks about security for a thermostat. Right? What, uh, your refrigerator? Software in your refrigerator? How about the microwave oven? It's got a little seven-segment display on it. Software in that. How about the, how about the dishwasher? It's go through cycles. How about your washing machine? Or your dryer? Or your telephones? You can't do anything in our society without software being in the way. Nothing. Nothing in our society happens without software. This did not used to be true. 
In the 1960s, you could do everything in our society without software. Now you can do nothing. Your grandmother, if you still have a grandmother, can do nothing without software being in the way. You can't call anybody. You can't, you can't wash the dishes. You can't wash the clothes. You can't put something in the refrigerator. You can't go drive your car. How much code is in a modern car? And by the way, right, this should scare the hell out of you. Because you know. There's a hundred million lines of code in a modern car. And I'm not talking about a Tesla. Right? I'm talking about a regular old car that you just buy. A hundred million lines of code in that car. Now, most of that is in the, the GPS system and the entertainment system. But some of it, some of it sits between you and the engine and the brakes. You'd like to think that when you put your foot on the brake, that there's a steel cable <laughs> that closes the calipers. But no, not anymore, no. Now, when you put your foot on the brake, there's an if statement in there. <laughs> And wouldn't you not, wouldn't you like to know who wrote that if statement? Did they have unit tests for that if statement? How many people have died because of that if statement breaking? Dozens, dozens of people have been killed because the software that controlled the brakes and the accelerator in cars failed. Dozens of people, you and I, are killing people. You and I did not get into this business to kill people. Most of us got into this business because we wrote an infinite loop at a department store once on a machine in basic that printed our name on the screen and we went, yeah, the power. But now we're killing people. Who's heard of uh, Night Capital? You know the story of Night Capital? I won't bore you with all the details. So suffice it to say that some poor software guy, actually it was a group of poor software guys, did some dumb thing and lost $450 million in 45 minutes. And the, the poor company, the, the CEO of the company woke up, because this all happened at midnight. And uh, the poor guy woke up in the morning and he didn't have a company anymore because the vultures had already bought it. Some poor software idiots did some dumb thing. $450 million got flushed down the tubes. What about um, 737 Max? That's an interesting one, isn't it? And Boeing keeps on making these announcements. So they, they, every, every, every couple of weeks now, like, oh, we found another bug. <laughs> At first I thought, you know, this is really a hardware problem, and, and they had a little software fix, and the software fix didn't quite go the way they wanted, but it was really a hardware problem. The more I hear about it, the more I think, no, this sounds like it was a software problem. We're killing people. Or let's talk about um, Volkswagen. That was an interesting one. The guys at Volkswagen decided to cheat California. And so they, they wrote code in the car that could determine whether they were on a test stand. And if they were on a test stand, it would change the characteristics of the engine so that the engine would emit less. But then when they took it off the test stand, they changed the characteristics back so that it would emit more. <laughs> now, eventually they got caught at this, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, but can you imagine the programmers? Right? Now, some, some people might make the argument that the programmers really didn't know what they were doing, right? They were just following requirements. Yeah, so I want you to put yourself in that situation. If, <laughs> so they got caught at this, and who heard the testimony of the uh, CEO of Volkswagen North America as he, uh, he was confronted by the Congress of the United States? Did anybody listen to that testimony? Okay, yeah, so here's, let me quote this for you. The, the Congress people asked him a very simple question. Sir, how could you have let this happen? And he said, and I quote, well, it was just a couple of software developers who did it for whatever reason. 
Now, it was a couple of software developers who did it. I think he knew the reason. But it was a couple of software developers who did it. So those guys, whoever they were, they put their fingers on the keyboard and they typed the cheating code. They're in jail. And they deserve to be in jail. You and I could go to jail for the code we write. Think of that. Someday... Some poor idiot is going to do some dumb thing. And it's going to kill 10,000 people at a shot. And you know this is going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And it's not hard to imagine what it might be. Someday, some poor software idiot is going to do some dumb thing and 10,000 people will die in a single moment and the politicians of the world will rise up in righteous indignation and they will point their fingers right at us. And they will ask us that question, same question that was asked of the CEO of Volkswagen North America. And you'd like to think that, no, they won't point their fingers at us, they'll point their fingers at our bosses, they'll point their fingers at our companies, won't be us. But the testimony of the CEO of Volkswagen North America made it very clear that those fingers would be directed right at us. And rightly so. They should be directed at us. It is our fingers on the keyboard. And they will ask us the question, how could you have let this happen? And we'd better have an answer for them. Because if our answer is, yeah, my boss told me it had to be done on Tuesday. If that's our answer, then the politicians of the world will do what they must. They will legislate. And they will tell us what platforms we can use and what languages we can use and what processes we have to follow and what signatures we have to get, what classes we have to take, and we will become a regulated industry. I'd like to avoid that. Now, I don't think there's a way to truly avoid it because society does not yet understand how much it depends on you and I. Society is somewhat ignorant of this. Nothing happens in our society without us, but society does not quite understand this yet. In some very real sense, you and I rule the world. Other people think they rule the world, and then they hand those rules to us. And we write the rules that execute on the machines that govern everything. And so at some point, society will demand that we be regulated. It's just, at some point, this must happen. And you'd, you'd like to think, well, there are parts of software that don't need to be regulated. Well, okay, which parts are those? The thermostat people? No, because you can recruit those thermostats and do denial of service attacks on someone. Anything that sits on the network, you'd have to have regulated, because damage can be done. If you're going to write code that sits on the network, if you're going to write code that operates in people's homes, if you're going to operate, write code that, that transports people or deals with money or deals with policy or deals with anything that society depends upon, you're likely to find yourself regulated sometime in the next N years. And when that happens, I would like to get there first. Because governments are inherently lazy. If we come up with the rules first, then when, when society decides to regulate us, we can simply hand them the rules. And they'll say, oh, great, we'll use those. That's what the doctors did. Right? The doctors had the rules all set beforehand. The lawyers, well, the lawyers wrote the rules, so who cares about them? <laughs> the architects, they had the rules beforehand. Yeah, the plumbers, they had the rules beforehand. When, when those industries got regulated, they got regulated with their own rules. But you and I don't have any. We haven't made the rules yet. We have no ethics. We have no standards. We have no defined disciplines. We are Wild West cowboys still. Now that's, I mean, it's only been 75 years. Why would we have invented anything so far? Why would we have established these rules? Most of us had no idea we were on this crazy exponential growth curve. But the day is coming. So, this talk, which I haven't really begun yet, 
is all about professionalism. Let's see if I can find that talk. Oh, yeah, there it is. I want you to imagine that I am your new CTO. Now, that's not a good idea. I would make a terrible CTO. I'm not a good manager at all. I, you know, I can get up and give a talk. Very good at that, but being a manager, no. But let's assume for the moment that I am a good manager and I'm your new CTO. What would I expect of you? What are my expectations? What you're going to hear over the next, oh, half hour or so, are a set of expectations that when you hear them, you will hear them with two ears. The one ear will be the ear of the programmer, and that ear will be yelling at you saying, this is insane. The other ear will be the ear of the normal human. And that ear will be saying to you, well, this is completely reasonable. I expect that we will not ship shit. <laughs> now, you can already hear the two ears, can't you, right? <laughs> the programmer's going, no, 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 that's crazy, man. We've got to ship shit. <laughs> we can't meet our deadlines unless we ship shit. You know, like, how the hell are we supposed to get anything done? They're not going to give us the time to not ship shit. And then the other side of your ear is saying, now, wait a minute, I, I never wanted to ship shit. It was not my goal in life. To, I never told my mom, Mom, I really want to ship shit. <laughs> and our users, our users never wanted that either. Oh, please give us shit. Yeah. <laughs> so you can hear the difference between the two ears. Right? Now, what does that mean? Well, I expect, and your users expect, and your managers expect, and everyone expects that what you deliver is good. It's high quality stuff. And you cannot say to yourself, well, they never give us time. You must never say that because the time is yours to take, not theirs to give. They don't understand, right? Managers don't understand. Users don't understand. They do not understand what we do. Only we understand that. And so only we can take the time that's necessary. And I understand the pressures, and I understand the deadlines, and I understand all of that. And yet, if we shit shit, it's our fault. We must not do that. Just keep that in mind. You know? And by the way, there's a whole bunch of people in the room who said, okay, well, yesterday I did. Maybe tomorrow I won't. How many of you are doing Agile? Yeah, Agile, huh? Well, and then, oh, yeah. You know, like, yeah. And if you're doing Agile, you're working in short iterations. How long are those iterations? Who's got one that's... Four weeks long. Who's doing four-week iterations? Typical scrum, right? 30 days. No, nobody. How about two weeks? Anybody doing two? Ooh, see? That's kind of the standard nowadays, two weeks. Two-week iterations. We all started with the idea that it would be three or four weeks. That's what we thought back in 1999 when we really started this whole thing. And then we realized that's nah, too long. Too much can go wrong in that period of time. And we started to shorten it and went down to two weeks. Everybody's kind of stuck there now. I kind of like one week. I think one week is better. And, you know, people don't like that because, oh, you can't get anything done in one week. And that's kind of the point. <laughs> right? Because I don't want a lot done because I want to get small things done and then check it and then a little small thing done and check it. I don't want to spend two weeks making a mess. So what's supposed to be done every iteration. What state is the software supposed to be in every iteration? Shippable. Deployable. Agile. Not shit. Yes, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Agile, one of the first tenets of Agile is at the end of every iteration, the system is deployable. The business might not want to deploy it because it might not have enough features 
For example, you may have done log out, but not log in. And the business might, want, might not want to deploy that. On the other hand, you would be happy to deploy it because it works. You've tested it. You've documented it. You know it works. So from a technical point of view, you are always ready. This is what I expect. I expect that on a very regular basis, like once a week or once every two weeks, you are ready. I don't want anybody telling me, oh man, we need months. We need months. And what are you going to do with those months? Well, there's the whole architecture thing to work out. You know, and then, and then you know we've got to burn it in. We got, we got to put it in a machine and run it and then watch it for like two months. And if it doesn't catch fire, then we'll ship it. I want you to be ready all the time. These burn-in things, by the way, the whole idea of stabilization sprints and burn-in sprints are really irresponsible. Right? You should know at the end of every sprint that everything you did works so that you can be comfortable deploying whenever the business says so. You're going through your iterations, sprint by sprint by sprint. You keep it ready to deploy. At some point, the business will say, hey, we got enough features. Let's deploy this. And your answer is yes. I expect stable productivity. What does that mean? It means I do not expect you to be going slower and slower and slower with time. How many of you have done that one? You're working on a system, and the, the first few weeks of the system, let's say it's a greenfield system. Who's, who's begun a greenfield project? Right? Hardly anybody. Oh, a few of you. Look at that. How fast can you go? The first few days, how fast can you go, right? Some guy says, can you give me a feature? Oh, yes. <laughs> you start coding and code pours out of every orifice of your body. <laughs> and it works. It works two weeks later and you know, business is looking at it going, wow, we've never seen programmers go that fast. Can you do it again? Yes. <laughs> you come back to that team a year later. Can you give us a feature? <laughs> Ooh. Probably take us, you know, like six months. But you used to be able to do this in two weeks. Yeah, but you don't know how complicated this system has become. Why, if we touch even one line of code, all hell could break loose. Take us at least six months. That's unstable productivity. And unstable productivity is a direct result of making a mess. Right? We made a mess. That's how we got to this unstable productivity. How do you make a mess? Well, <laughs> that way. We decided we were going to go really fast. And the way we're going to go really fast is by making the biggest mess we could conceive of. Now, I'm stretching the truth a little bit here. But, how do you stop that? How do you stop the mess? How many of you are working on a system now where the mess is so great and so tall that no one can clean it? No one at all. The cat in the hat, yes, okay, good, yeah. <laughs> so here's the situation. You're staring at your screen. You bring up some code, and you look at that code, and you go, oh, shit. <laughs> and you say to yourself, and I should clean this. And your next thought is, I'm not touching it. Because right? I know if I touch it, I will break it. And if you break it, it becomes yours. So you walk away. You're not going to touch that code. Now, that's a fear reaction. Right? You fear the code. You fear to touch the code. And if that is your reaction... 
then the only thing that can happen to that code is that it must rot. It must get worse and worse with time because you will not do the one thing that will prevent that rot. You will not clean it. And so it must rot. We all wonder, why does the code keep getting worse and worse? Well, because no one cleans it. Well, why don't they clean it? Because they're scared to clean it. They can't clean it. The risk is too high. And so why does it rot? Well, because you keep on changing it. But every time you change it, you change it in a way that minimizes your personal risk. Does not maintain the design of the system, does not keep the system clean. It minimizes your personal risk. Everything you are doing as a programmer is out of fear. And this is wildly irresponsible. Incredibly irresponsible. No profession could tolerate that. You must not lose control of the thing you have created. And that's typically what we do. We lose control of our own creation. And so our own creation dominates us. We don't dominate it. How do we solve that problem? Well, I'd like you to imagine that there's a button you could push. And if you push that button, little lights would blink for maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds. And then a little green light would light up, and that little green light means that the whole system works. You have a test suite. You push the button on that test suite, it tells you that everything works. If you had that button, and I know that's an impossibility, maybe. But if you had that button, then when you brought code up on your screen, and you said, oh, I should clean this. Your next thought would be, I'll change the name of that variable. Push the button. Oh, agreed. Good. Uh, that function's too big. I think I'll split it in half. Push the button. Ah, green. Okay. Ooh, I should take that half of the function and move it over there. Push the button. Red. Ooh, put it back. <laughs> Push the button. Green. Ha ah. Oh, I see. I need to put it over here. Push the button. Green. If you had that button, you could clean the code. If you had that button, you would clean the code because cleaning the code would be trivial. There would be no risk. It would be a matter of a few minutes to do some gentle act to the code to make it a little bit better. And everyone would be able to do that. Every time they touched the code, they could make it just a little bit better. It would be trivial. It would be obvious. You could keep control of the code. The code would stay clean. The code would stay maintainable. The code would stay... Flexible. In fact, it is flexible because you have that button. Think carefully on that because it tells us that we've got to find a way to get that button. I'll leave it to you to figure out what that is. Although I will mention a discipline here. How many of you are doing test-driven development? That's about a third of you. What the hell is the matter with the rest of you? I expect inexpensive adaptability. It should not be expensive to change software. Or rather, the cost of a change should be proportional to the scope of the change. From the point of view of the user. Not from the point of view of the programmer. So the user says, you know, there's a little change I need to make, and it's, it's not a big change. I just need to add a field here and change a calculation there. No big deal. And the programmer goes, oh, God. This completely ruins my beautiful architecture, man. It's like I'm going to have to rip the code to shreds in order to accommodate that. That is a failed architecture. Because the scope of the change from the user's point of view is small, But the scope of the change from the programmer's point of view is huge. Therefore, the programmers did not understand their users, did not understand what kind of changes were going to be coming, and implemented the wrong design. Now, what's the best way to change a design? Now that you have the wrong design, what's the best way to change the design? Be nice to have that little button, wouldn't it? You can shift the design, push the button, I expect everything gets better. Continuous improvement. I expect 
that the system gets better with time. The design of the system gets better with time. The architecture of the system gets better with time. The code in each module gets better with time. All the programmers get better with time. I expect continuous improvement. I do not expect things to get worse. None of us should. We're human beings. Human beings make things better. Human beings counter entropy. We are not the slaves of entropy. Well, in one sense we are. But not in the local state here, not in the local system. In this local system, we we fight entropy and we don't want this constant degradation of our software. I expect it always to get better. This is a perfectly reasonable expectation that every user has, every manager has. I expect fearless competence. I don't want you to be afraid of the code. I want you to be competent and fearless. When the code needs changing, I want you to be able to change it. And I want you to be able to change it without fear. I expect the quality to be extremely high. This is just another way of saying we're not going to ship shit. But I expect the quality to always be extremely high. Anybody here have uh, QA organizations? Why do you have QA organizations? Why would a, a company invest in a completely separate group to make sure that the programmers were doing their jobs. Because the programmers weren't doing their jobs. Right? That's why we have QA. No organization would start out with QA. They would normally just start out with some programmers, and then the programmers turned out not to be doing their jobs, and they were shipping shit. And so we have to get QA people to make sure that the programmers don't ship shit. How do you know if the QA people are doing a good job? <laughs> they find defects. The more defects they find, the better job they must be doing. So now there's a group in the company that has a value on defects. They want defects. You know who else wants defects? There's an old rule in software. I can meet any schedule you set for me if it doesn't have to work. So defects have a positive value to programmers. Defects allow you to meet your schedule. QA people like defects too because it means they're doing their job and an economy can set, be set up. No one has to say a word. Just every both sides know that both sides have a value and they just ship the defects back and forth. <laughs> that is an extreme disease that pollutes many, many companies. And therefore... We will not dump on QA. I expect that we are not going to... I'm QA now here, right? <laughs> Waiting for the load to be delivered. <laughs> I do not expect that we're going to do that. We're not going to dump a whole bunch of defects on QA. I want QA to find nothing. QA should wonder why they have a job. Right? They should be... Every time they run the system, every time they run their tests, they should find nothing. That's, and if they do find something, all the programmers should go, how the hell did that happen? We gotta plug that hole, cause QA should find nothing. Of course, everything should be automated. One more. One more, one more, one more, one. Uh, I should talk about this one, huh? I should talk about this one. Okay, alright. I expect honest estimates. What's the most honest estimate you can make? I don't know. That is the most honest estimate you can make because it's the absolute truth. You don't know. Don't second, don't believe that you do know, you don't know. On the other hand, there are some things you do know. So, you know the shape of the risk. I could ask this question a different way. I could say, give me three numbers. Give me three, and this is the old PERT scheme, by the way, if anybody's ever studied PERT. Give me three numbers. Give me uh, the number that, uh, how, how long will it take you if everything goes right? And I mean everything. You know, you eat the right breakfast cereal in the morning, and you don't have any fight with your significant other, and your, your coworkers are always polite, and there's no meetings. <laughs> how long would it take you then? And you go, oh, you know, in that case, it would take me about a week. Okay, now, how long would it take if things go the way they normally go? Uh, it would probably take me about three weeks. 
Okay. And now, how long is it going to take you if everything goes wrong? Like, short of nuclear war, everything goes wrong. Well, it's going to take me probably six weeks. That's a really honest answer. That's a very honest answer. And that's, that's the answer you should always give. Some kind of probability assessment. Some kind of curve of probabilities. Because you don't know where you're falling in that curve. You don't know what the state of the company is going to be or the state of your life is going to be. So you should give that kind of a range. And then every day you can narrow that range. Every day you can say, you know, things have been going pretty good. I can shorten that range a little bit. Ooh, things have been going bad. I can widen the range a little bit. Managers are going to come to you and they're going to say, I don't like this range. I just want to know if you're going to get it done. And the answer is, I don't know. All I know is the range. Ah, that's not good enough. Will you at least try? (laughs) Now, don't fall for this one. All right? The answer to that question is no. I, how dare you think that I am not trying? How dare you accuse me of not trying, you son of a... No, don't do that. <laughs> don't. That should be going through your head, right? The emotional reaction should be that. Because it's insulting to be asked to try. The answer you should give is, I'm sorry, sir, but we are already trying as much as we possibly can. There's, there are no, nothing, no, no reserve held in back, held in reserve. There's nothing held back. There's no magic beans in my pocket. All I can offer you is this probability. I can't give you a guaranteed date. And then the manager will have to do something very foreign. They'll have to manage. That's what management is. Management is about managing risk. They were trying to manage risk by putting the risk on you. You must never say yes unless you know you can meet the, meet the goal. And never, never, never say yes to that try question. Will you at least try? Well, of course I'll try. Because you've just lied. You've just told an enormous lie. Because there's nothing new you're going to do. There's no no new behavior you're going to exhibit because you suddenly said you would try. Nothing has really changed. I expect that you're going to say no when the answer is no. The most valuable thing you can say to an organization is no. The most valuable thing you can say to a manager is no when the answer really is no. Because it's you standing between the company and oblivion. And you must never do that horrible passive-aggressive thing, which is, well, they wanted to do it, so I went along with them. Never do that. That's, a, that's probably the worst human characteristic there is, that passive-aggressive thing. I, I let them do it, you know, because they're idiots, and I'm the smart one, but, but, you know, don't ever fall for that one. You were hired because you know. They don't know. You know. And so you have to be able to say no when the answer is no. Now, I'm not telling all the junior engineers that they should stand up and go, no! (laughs) The senior people... And I think with that, I've extended my time just a little bit. Does anybody have any questions before I abandon the stage? If you have any questions, you can press the button on, uh, on the, just in front of you, and you have a microphone. Would I sign your book? Yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll be hanging around here, so if anybody wants something like that, I'll just be around. Otherwise, thank you all for your attention. If someone has a question, yell it now. Otherwise, I'm, I'm out of here. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.